inspiration, particularly as most potently manifested in personified romantic form, what Jung means by his classic definition of a man's anima. Get it as an animation? By way of such metaphorical understanding, it can be appreciated that sexual orientation and romantic soul are not necessarily in their functioning particularity simply preordained by, nor in merely automatic compensation for a person's biological gender, or for a basic bodily identification congruently as a biological male or female. Although such causal connections have been usually assumed in classical Jungian thought about human sexuality, but instead are more realistically considered to develop from their own autonomous factors at a later stage of compounding subjective growth in league with that previously achieved biological identification. But out in this way, the basic figuration of the contrasexual an gender anima. <coughs> can be appreciated to coalesce in the unconscious psyche of every man. Yet it does not necessarily carry the central electrifying meaning of deepest soul arousal as provoked by a genitally defining soul figure. Whereas alternatively, when the libidinal essence edibly animates the phallic double, the personified iconic image of a man's own male gender also carried representatively in his unconscious, then it is in this twinning figurational pattern that the elemental genital soul transfixes him and seeks productive romantic union, first in compelling projective form. It is this amorous Dioscurian image then that emblematically portrays his most aroused feelings and best passionate experiences of bewitching soul possession such that the responsive man, thus so faithfully grasped, initially becomes aware, but dimly, of his conforming emotive soul twin in the incestuous childhood yearning for his father, and later, through the same helpful mechanism of libidinal transformative felt sublimation, as also occurs to heterosexual boys, more clearly in the hotly stimulating forms of attractive men and their images, as manifested through those diverse piquant variations of sexual and romantic pattern pubescently emerge in parallel to that expressive range typically seen in adult heterosexuality. Yet, behind all these divinely scrumptious homosexual soul images, as they appropriately concern the healthfully maturing growth of psychic object relations, and the unfolding symbolic mystery of mutual romantic love in the respectful humanistic way being thematically appreciated by this upright circumambulating discussion causally lies that entrancing archetypal figure we have been here suggestively exploring, the Bible wraith buddy soul, an awesomely erotic male presence as the personified magical twin to one's own penis, a mesmerizingly attentive spirit being, singularly attuned, electrifyingly luscious, dazzlingly regal, beautifully different, yet thrillingly mirroring, outrageously incestuous, while verdantly nutritious, <laughs> whose doubly desired embrace is the mutually riveting experience of finest qualitative completion and treasurably renewing symbolic return to the all-possible primal source, whose luminous sorcerous semen is the most procreative due of heavenly incorporative attainment. To encounter the personally activated double soul in such like glorious amative fashion would be iconic and ecstatic it can be easily pictured, conveying an unrefusable symbolic invitation in the radiant eternal heart to earnestly climb a wondrously accessing atomic ladder from elemental earth to superlative heaven, and so live completionally with a soul twin also succulently thereby matured forever distillationally embodied in existent beings' fine paradisal perfection. I recall that when I worked with Harry May 
in founding the Radical Furry Movement in the late 1970s, he would repeatedly and lyrically tell the story of his childhood dream to find another boy like himself. And the two of them would then walk hand in hand up a beautiful green hill to greet a glorious sunrise. Is that not suggestive of the heavenly motif I was just describing? Such an overwhelmingly heartfelt, transcendent invitation, and its eagerly enthusiastic reply in young childhood, would then set in motion the archetypal theme of romance as that lifelong personal undertaking which depthfully reflects the genuine subjective gravity of finding paramount gay love for gay people. The clarion call and responsive yearning to focally relate with this dazzlingly customized heaven likeness and accordingly to be fully incarnately wedded productively in completing valuational partnership to him satisfyingly forever. A amorous tensional dynamic initiating in consequence a supreme heroic quest, the search for the other self and there so its geminational metaphysical source. The such wise chosen child, well seduced by this masterfully rousing romance, richly inspired by the romantic <coughs> ideals of homosexual love, with that utmost innocent sincerity as only young passion can be, will then most movingly attempt to climb an accessioning divine ladder in his thereby transformable sacred heart and to do so will capably usher him analogically into an alchemical, perilous journey conducted phenomenally within his evolving subjective being, by which route the goodly formation of a strong conscious ego and a meritorious gay identity will occur together self-directionally in the developmental context of a nutritively embodying homosexual personhood of increasingly meaningful scope and enhanced substantiating depth. <coughs> when the intended gay man to be, joyously first transfixed at the age of three, four, or five, by the mesmeric calling of his ravishing beloved in the mythic Uranian familiar complex thereby becoming passionately well established, when he spiritedly reaches out to courageously start his stalwart climb on the sensational divine ladder to heaven, he must of necessity grasp the hand of a dark lord as well as that of a light one, because it turns out that the metaphorical divine ladder is ruled over by oppositional twin gods. In ancient Egyptian thought, most typically portrayed by the brothers Horus and Seth. And formidable Seth's contributing hand is a sticky mass of wriggling snakes, much as the later Greeks pictured serpentine Typhon, one of the giant titans. By way of a young boy's hearty answer to the numinous call for homosexual romantic love, therefore, a Typhonian reversal twistingly occurs within the nation's subjective realm. The godlike inspirational yearning for utter romantic merger with the literal phallic father is inevitably thwarted by the forbidding incest taboo, which is also archetypally innate. And this developmentally required failure accordingly transforms, instead of only eliminates, the dastardly incest wish into the viable basis for all later amatory yearnings, as that same libidinal change helps better constellate and strengthen a budding proto-ego, already much advanced maturationally due to its initial incestuous wishing. 
so that it might better reach for its ultimate desirous goal through not only a feminine, matrimonial, motivic identification, but one cohesively fortified even more by inevitable defeat and literally supplanting mother's place with father. The germinating gay ego, thus was developmentally supported and androgynously propelled, is cast down symbolically in our imaginary exploration into a subliminal confrontation with the fecund darkness of the unconscious over the now shameful issue of genital meaning as it grows in sensible coherence during the ensuing latency stage of psychosexual evolution. And so that differentiating ego must unknowingly enact the difficult combat of fraternal horrors and self. This subterranean allegorical struggle during the prepubescent years is the shapefully engaging mechanism for the far-seeing double soul's further effectuation of goodly subjective self-becoming. It has the character of an erotically charged but dangerous wrestling match, by which a nurturing give-and-take relationship with the needful unconscious through interior romantic bonding can be usefully established, to the extent that such a hard-fought struggle can be sufficiently it's sustained, as the infernal underworld task is worked through subconsciously by way of this nutritious combat over edible desire versus shame, a dewy resolutional intelligence is eventually inseminated supernaturally and then embodied alchemically within the maturing child's eternal heart. A new guiding connection to something like primordially wise thought, Egyptian god of wisdom and realization, is well established there. And a divine reigning mystery of the combative two partners culminatingly reveals itself. Percipient thought brings about a reunion of the conflictual opposites in meaningfully growing psyche. There is a magical, metamorphic reconciliation with the fractious unconscious, and then a most precious birth in the dawn of coming pubescent enlightenment. This entire sequence of sound personality development propels an unconscious childhood differentiation that prepares the way for coherent individual consciousness and adult emotional life. Now, a newly expanded emergence of the ardent double soul can occur with the stirring advent of waxing sexual adolescence so as to confront the more advanced proto-ego in a more conscious way with an echoing recapitulation of the initial invitation in the sacred heart, a rejuvenated reaching to stalwartly climb the heavenward divine ladder, now through romantic genital attraction to other males more generally, followed by another twisting typhoon in reversal, additionally fed by having to live in a heterosexist, homophobic world. Again, the intrepid personality, well supplied by the genuinely bottomless vigor of its most heartful procreative calling, is nicely enabled to progress persistently through the daunting underworld combat so mutationally entailed, but now is genitally well harnessed in an increasingly cognizant manner to elevationally reach, by such dualistic amative means, a novel insemination of finer awakening intelligence in the gleaming love garden of the archetypal fathomful heart, thereby lushly, caringly fertilized, and willfully, consequently flourishing, to finally result, narratively, in the sterling native bloss natal blossoming of an emergent ego integrity, of strengthening substantive proportions, simultaneously becoming aware and accepting of its fetistic homosexual nature, confirmed te terminologically through the crowning, grounded assumption of a transcendentally valued gay identity. In this virtuous way of the good homosexual art, as a legitimate alternative mode of beneficially differentiating the feeling function to a heterosexual approach, 
for the estimable sake of achieving a sure sensibility of singularly meaningful personhood constitutionally well actualized, a prospectively oriented gay man is more than adequately empowered symbolically to finally complete the escalating rungs of the illuminatory divine ladder and celebratorily enter that heavenly abiding relationship with his beautifully perfected twin soul which they have both so passionately desired. The noble quest rewardingly well fulfilled at this appropriate level of inward challenge and compositional growth, true gay love <coughs> humanistically redeemed to a satisfyingly embodied adult life, the deserving hero existentially exalted to that value degree from developmental failure and life-crippling shame. This